if community development is going to be real, and I think it's what th this work is really based in, is you start working with a group and you take a step. And because you've taken this step, you then figure out what the next step is going to be. And after this step, you figure out what the next step is going to be. And it's true that you're headed in a direction. You know, if you're making a play about violence, you're not making it because you think violence is a good thing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, like the play has an agenda, <laughs> of course, but, but you, so it sits in a container, but you don't know what the end product is going to be. And often there are really wonderful and sometimes challenging surprises. Imagine Action Podcast. Imagination. Creando comunità trasformative. Imagination. Social arts across borders. Live not che he lot transformative. Building transformative communities for future. Hello, welcome to Imagine Action Podcast. In this episode, I'm speaking with David Diamond about his journey to discover and found theater for living. Enjoy. I discovered theater at 17, when I was 17, kind of fell into the theater. Um, I wanted to be a writer and I tried to get a writing course in my school and there wasn't one, but there was this drama program and I don't know, I'd never been to see a play, but it, you know, it was artistic. And so I started doing drama and I know this sounds weird. Well, maybe lots of people experience this, but I was getting applause then for doing things on stage that I was getting punished for, for doing things in my life. <laughs> and, and this whole world opened up of self-expression and and being validated and uh so then i decided to become an actor and i went off to theater school and i came out of theater school and was an actor in mainstream theater working all over western canada film tv live stage radio and then got frustrated me and a number of people because the actor's job is to sit by the telephone and say yes to anything that comes. And most of it's shit, frankly. And we wanted to make something about something meaningful. And so we all had housing problems. And so we made a play about organizing for affordable housing. And we didn't know we were going to start a theater company, but it was this massive cult hit. It took us completely by surprise. It, it was angry and it named politicians and demanded resignations and it was funny and it had music in it and we re rewrote it every day based on what was happening in the news and, and it played in a different place every night. So you had to really work to find it. And it was packed every night. And so then there was another project and another project and then I took over, uh, it had been a collective and the collective kind of dissolved and it got handed to me. I, I turned into the person who was raising money and booking tours and then helping write the shows and acting in the shows. And, um, and there was obviously something there, but I had a question inside me. We'd been really good at doing it, doing it, Agit prop theater, you know, agitation propaganda theater. We would decide what the issue was. We would go and interview people who were living the issue. And then we'd lock ourselves in a room, pretend we were them and write a play about them, aimed at them. And, and because we were young, I think, uh, we all we also thought we knew all the answers. <laughs> Yeah, so we would tell them what to do in the play to solve their problems. And we were good at it. And I think sometimes agitprop is important to do. But I wondered about how to do it with them, not for them. And I managed to 
get some invitations to go uh, to the UK to visit John McGraw, who was the director of 784 Theatre Company. Um, we'd become friends by then. And uh, 784 was the oldest uh, 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 socialist theater in the UK at the time. And Dave Johnston, who was director at uh, Theatre Centre, which was a really well-respected theatre and education company in London. And before I left, I wanted something to read. And I went to a bookstore and I picked up this book by this guy I'd never heard of, Paulo Freire, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. I just liked the title. I didn't know what it was. And I'm traveling through Europe, having a very valuable time with wonderful people. And I'm reading this book and it's blowing my mind <laughs> because it's, it's actually answering the question I had. And then I ended up in uh, at a conference where a guy named Chris Vine, who many people will know, he's now in New York, um, was doing a demonstration of this thing called Forum Theater by this guy, Augusto Boal, another Brazilian. And I'm sitting there going, holy shit, that, that's what I'm reading about in this book. <laughs> They're the same thing. And Boal at that point was in Paris having left Brazil and was offering a skills sharing workshop in two weeks and you know, the magic of Europe, boom, off to Paris. And Boal and I hit it off. We, I, I think because I was already making political theater. And so the doorway in was uh, uh, like with everybody, you know, a long step by step by step journey where I think I just kept following my nose, frankly. And so then I, I came back here with all this stuff from Boal and didn't know what to do with it. Um, and, in, and just when I got back, wrote uh, a play um, called The Enemy Within. I got that title from Margaret Thatcher and um, toured that play, it was about busting unions. Uh, um, it was actually a character assassination of the current premier of British Columbia coming up into the election. It was agitprop. Um, and uh, trying to figure out what to do with all this theater of the oppressed stuff. And then, you know, because this is how my brain works, I already had a touring network. So I booked a tour of workshops. I, I worked a process out on paper, five days, to take a group from zero to performance. It looked good on paper, but the only way to know if it worked was to do it. And so six or seven communities across British Columbia went, yeah, this sounds interesting, we'll do this. We'll bring groups together and, you know, and I was very clear with them. I had no idea what I was doing. We were going on an adventure together. And um, the first one was with the Stalo Nation, an uh, indigenous nation just up the valley here from Vancouver. And lo and behold, we made really important plays about issues in the community and had a powerful forum theater event in the community. And it was raw and it was, you know, there were, you know, 40 years later, I might do things differently than happened then, but, but it was very powerful. And over the course of the tour, with the generosity of all these people, I figured out what, what I was doing. And then, you know, started larger projects and, and the company flourished and people responded very powerfully to the work. And you know, I'll just say, because I, I think it's important for people to hear stuff like this. At one point, you know, it was getting a lot of attention. And this is a, a before email. <laughs> um, Boal and I would communicate on paper through the mail. And uh, I, I wrote to him and I said, you know, I, I feel like an imposter. Uh, there's lots of media and I'm doing interviews and people are loving the work, but I feel like I'm doing somebody else's work. 
and, and I'm just lying. And he wrote me back this very generous letter and he said, look, all of us go through that. If you're getting attention and people are liking what you're doing, it's because of what you're doing, not because of anybody else. So relax. And this was very important for me, from him in that moment. And I think everybody who does this work really needs to take that in because you have to make the work your own. It's the only way to do it. You can't do somebody else's work because it's also about continuing to invent it as you go. Otherwise it just becomes mechanical. And once it becomes mechanical, it's dead. Yeah, well, this, this is a good build up for the second question, which is, um, which is around what has been guiding you? What has been your, your inner lighthouse or, or guides outside that have been guiding you in this long journey? Uh, that not easy journey. A lot of people give up, you know, change, not, not an easy life or journey. When we started, of course, we had to do marketing. And there was this wonderful woman, her name is Saide, and she was in a play. Uh, Saide, you know, is a dear friend. She knows I tell stories about her, it's fine. Um, <laughs> Saide uh, came to Canada as a refugee from Iran, although she is originally from Pakistan. She married an Iranian, they were, uh, in Iran, hiding students under Khomeini. They got caught, they had to leave. They spent some time in Italy and then came here. She and I met through Amnesty International. And she was an actor in a play that I did about refugee issues. And she got very turned on by the work and it ended up working with me for eight years. Um, and she was the theater company's first outreach coordinator. You know, there's a saying, you know, Saide could sell a hump to a camel. She was incredible. And she got on, she would get on the phone. We had this thing called the Red Book and it had all the kind of social service agencies in it listed. And she would just get on the phone and phone them and be able to get into long conversations with people and say, I have this thing that you need. And, you know, for every 30 phone calls Saturday would make, there'd be one person who was really interested in more than just talking to her, you know, but the work started to book. And um, we eventually had to like stop her because we couldn't respond to the work. We had to go, you, you have to stop. And at one point there was a, big, a facilitation team and we, we couldn't deal with it. Um, and I think that's important for people because people are reluctant to sell themselves, but it has to start somewhere. There's a difference between getting an invitation because you've contacted somebody and gotten them interested and then they've invited you. There's a difference between that and imposing yourself on a community. Going, well, I have this great thing and I'm coming to rescue you. They're not the same thing. <laughs> But eventually, I made a decision that the marketing would stop and that we would only respond to invitations that came. Email would come, the phone would ring, because, because knowledge had built out, out in communities. By, you know, it took years. And so the question about what guide has guided me is invitations. Um, and trying to make sure they're legitimate invitations. That it's not just, you know, the person, because you don't know who's getting in touch with you. It could be the community wacko. You, you don't know. And so, you know, one of the things I always do is I insist that there's a little a committee of people working to bring me in, not one lone person, because you don't know. Um, and so, because it's invitations, that also in conversation determines how the work should happen. 
um, you know, it's about designing something that will be healthy in the community, knowing that once you get there and actually meet the people you're going to work with, that might all go out the window. <laughs> but, but I want to come in with a plan. Otherwise, I don't feel safe. Um, and so, yeah, invitations have guided me and also building strong connections with lots of communities. And the, again, you know, following your nose, there are things that bubble up that are, that, that need attention. And, um, you know, so sometimes a project would happen because a community would invite it and it would turn into a big project. Uh, the, the meth play was invited and ended up touring all over Western Canada. And sometimes it, was, it would be me going, I think it'd be important to do a play on gang violence and contacting communities that were struggling with it and going, would this be a good idea? You know, this is who we are, you know, would this be good? And then going, it would be fantastic. And, you know, the gang violence play was created and performed in a Sikh temple here in Vancouver. That's how deeply it was embraced by the community. Um, and so what guides you is, authentic relationships, I guess, is what it boils down to. You know, I, I, I've done a lot of arguing with people about this. Um, people in the mainstream theater, because outreach, community outreach and marketing are not the same thing. And they get confused. Marketing is trying to sell something, you know? And community outreach is simply having legitimate, authentic, mutually beneficial relationships with people and organizations. Um, and so, you know, with the theater company, sometimes we would be able to go, oh, organization A, do you know organization B? You don't? you need to know each other because you can do things together that would be amazing. And that had nothing to do with any project we were doing. You know, it was just us being a good community member. Um, and, you know, is there a byproduct of that that's good for the company? Uh, yes, there is, because people trust you. <laughs> you know, you're not, you're not always trying to sell them something. You don't always trying to get them to do you a favor and come see your play. You're, you know, and, and so it's relationships. I think the answer to your question is relationships. I, I hear relationships. And I also remember the first answer, which is this relationship is a, a magical helper uh, and, and a re relationship as well. And, and, and this also this kind of, um, I wrote this work for the invitation which is like work with invitation, but it's also working for to being in the position to be invited, which is also connected about building community and connections, even if yeah. it's not benefiting you directly somehow, because, yes. because it's part of uh, being, and then I wrote like, be, uh, you said now being a good community member. Yeah, you know, and, and just to come back full circle, um, I have had this conversation with many people who do this kind of work and they're very reluctant to kind of try to sell themselves. Well, how are invitations supposed to start coming if nobody knows who you are? Like, I actually understand that it's in a way distasteful, but it's necessary. And, and then if your work is good, invitations will start to come, but the, the community will tell you. So I, I want to bring it to the third question, which actually brings us to another territory of this work, which is uh, the frustrations, the challenges. 
So what have been and or still could be uh, have been frustrations well, and challenges you have met? In, in yeah. So I mean, the, the really big one for me and the reason I closed the company now two years ago is you know part of what was really important for me in it is that whenever somebody's doing something for the organization it's work and we live in a capitalist culture whether we like to admit that or not and what pays the rent what buys the food is money and so people need to be paid and they need to be paid it, for me, above union wages, because it's hard work. And so that meant I was fundraising every day of my life. And because the work is what it is, it really exists on the edges of what funders uh, think is fundable, <laughs> you know? What do you mean you're going to bring a group of people together and you actually don't know what the end result play is going to be? Give us a script and we'll see if we want to fund it. Well, I can't do that. It's going to get created as we're doing it. And, and I also need you to understand that because it's, you know, there's an empowerment uh, uh, aspect to this, that the people making it, it's possible they're going to make a play that goes that is contrary to the um, priorities of the funding body. <laughs> and, and that needs to be okay. <laughs> and so, you know, funding was often hard to get. <laughs> uh, it started up a good 10 years ago. This thing, uh, uh, I don't know if you're dealing with this, it's called social innovation now. And it's a, it's a corporate model of community development. So if community development is gonna be real, and I think it's what th this work is really based in, is you start working with a group and you take a step. And because you've taken this step, you then figure out what the next step is gonna be. And after this step, you figure out what the next step is gonna be. And it's true that you're headed in a direction. You know, if you're making a play about violence, you're not making it because you think violence is a good thing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, like the play has an agenda, <laughs> of course, but, but you, so it sits in a container, but you don't know what the end product is going to be. And often they're really wonderful and sometimes challenging surprises. But in social innovation, that model, they want a three to five year arc and predetermined outcomes. It's a corporate model and it is in direct opposition to how I think this work can be healthy. And I tried for a while to dance that dance with them and you know, but, it, but it's, it's, it's anti-ethical to the work. And so I started getting into big arguments with funders and instead of the money being easier after many years of success, it was getting harder. So that was a frustration. Um, uh, another frustration, you know, sometimes was, you know, when I said you have to be, you don't know who is inviting you. I was very careful about stuff. And even with that, there were sometimes shocking surprises. So you know, being invited into a community to do work and being very clear, of course, that the work is voluntary. You know, you can't force people to do this sort of stuff. And that the participants, you know, we would provide all this material and the participants need to have some sense of what they're coming to do. Otherwise, how can they agree that they want to do it? And arriving places and having a group of youth literally, I mean this, marched into the room that I was waiting in, in single file. And they've discovered they're going to make plays on addiction issues. This morning, they got told this morning. 
And now we're sitting there and they don't know who I am and they don't know really why they're there. And I'm going, oh, this is what the hell just happened. And, you know, I explained the best I could and said to them, you know, you're pissed off. I'm pissed off. <laughs> it's not supposed to be like this. Uh, look, because I'd driven 10 hours. This is, you know, Canada. It's a different guy, 10 hours to be there. And uh, I said, I explained and I said, look, just give me two or three hours. Let me give you a taste of what this is. And if you don't want to do it, I honor that it's over. And they said, okay. And we did some stuff and they didn't want to do it. <laughs> it had been brought together terribly badly. And I said, right, okay. And then I walked into the office and we had a huge fight. And I'm not afraid to do that. They were from my point in breach of contract and owed me the whole fee, which of course they never paid. <laughs> um, you know, and those sorts of things didn't happen often. But it, when you ask about frustration, that's a big deal. And I'm, I, I'm not sure frustrated is the right word, but I'm very concerned with the state of the theater of the oppressed community. It's not just happening in TO, I think it's happening all over the world right now, is that the world is polarizing. And it's also happening in the TO community. It's been happening for some time since Boel died. And I have a fear that there are aspects of the community, not the whole community, that are becoming a mirror of the very thing they say they're fighting against. And this is happening all over the world. And it, it is the thing that concerns me the most in the world right now. How do we build bridges between people with whom we disagree and not build more walls? Come back next week for the second part of the episode. If you like the podcast, like, share, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Support me in making the podcast on Coffee slash Imagine Action. Subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. And stay tuned for the next episode.